My text is Colossians 3 and verse 11. Colossians 3 and verse 11. As I've just said to you, business as usual. And would to God that this was the usual business. I don't mean just in preaching. I wish it was the business of my life. The mind and the heart. This is a text. Paul writing the Colossians says, Christ is all. That's my text. Preacher has three points, doesn't he? Well, I've got three words. Christ is all. If you want a bit more, he goes on to say, Christ is all and in all. He doesn't seem to be leaving any loophole for any addition, or any escape clause. There's no and with this man. Christ is all. That's the subject. That's the, the point. But of course, we must, business as usual, we must have a look a bit at the context here. Notice, I don't know if your, what your version does, but my version starts with the word but. But Christ is all and is in all. In other words, there's a contrast here. Something is true, something is going on, but in contrast to that, Christ is all. That's what he's saying to them. So what is he saying? Well, what's the previous uh, passage about? In my version here, it says, here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all. What does he mean? Well, just think about this. Greek, Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, and you could put a lot more in there. Other parts of the Bible do this. They put male and female in there. You could put rich and poor. You could put clever, learned, intelligent, academic, and not so clever, not so academic. Put all those things together, things that mean so much to the man in the street, People go to war over things like this. What do you mean? What's going on in the Middle East? Jew and Arab. What's going on in the Balkans quite often? Slav against Slav or whatever it might be. Slav against Islam or whatever it is. Nationality means everything to some people. Male or female, rich or poor, class distinctions. What is Paul saying? All that's rubbish, he says. None of that counts at all, but, of course, he's talking to believers, we understand that. In the world, whether you're a Jew or a Greek, or whether you're a, a rich man or a poor man, whether you've got two cars or uh, a pedal cycle, that all matters. It wasn't so long ago that the rich people went to the Church of England and the poor people went to the um, little tabernacles, tin tabernacles. I, I, I remember hearing people say on, on films and that, oh, we don't pray with the toffs. We don't pray with the toffs. They used to say the Conservative Party, uh, the, the, the Church of England was the Conservative Party in prayer. They used to say that. Politics mean everything, to, but for the believer, but for the believer, and you found this, brother and sister, as soon as you meet a believer, it doesn't matter where they've come from and where you've come from, there's something, no, there's someone, Christ makes a union between you, and it overcomes the fact that I'm old and you're young. Uh, my hearing's gone to pieces, yours is pristine. All that, we can make do with that. All that's nothing. Because Christ is all. Now, I say believers, but let me just take time a moment. 
I'll remind you of the first paragraph here. If I said to you, tell me what a Christian is. Today, I think there'd be quite a number of people would say, well, he goes to chapel or to church, he says his prayers, he's a decent person. Listen to Paul describing believers. Verse 1, since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Let's just think about this. What he's talking about in this paragraph, what is a Christian? He is a man or a woman who is united to Christ. That's the only way you can read that paragraph. It isn't a question whether he goes to chapel or the Church of England or whether he's a Baptist or a Presbyterian or whether he's a man or a woman. All that sort of thing is nothing, so long as he is united to Christ. Bishop wrote a very powerful tract once. You can be a Presbyterian, you can be a Baptist, you can be an Anglican, you can be this, but are you in Christ? This is the point. What do you mean by in Christ? You died with Christ. You were raised with Christ. He tells the Ephesians you're actually seated in heaven with Christ. This is a mystery. But we were all born in Adam. That means to say all that Adam got by his fall has come to me through my dad. And it came to him through his dad. And it came to you through your dad too. But by the Spirit of God, I read in my Bible, as Jesus told Nicodemus, by the Spirit of God, he takes a dead sinner in Adam and he transfers him into Christ. How did he do that? By regenerating him, making him born again, bringing him to trust the Savior. And the moment he trusts the Savior, he passes from that state, Adam's state, into Christ. Now, when he was in Adam, all these differences meant everything. But the moment he's in Christ, they're all gone. Why? Because Christ is all. He says in that same paragraph, this is not the end. Christ is coming again. And I commented on it when I read to you. When he appears in glory, you too will be raised, of course, physically as well now, and raised up, and you will appear with him in glory. Do you understand that? I don't. To think of it, my brother and sister, when Christ appears in his glory, because he is all and in all, we shall appear with him in glory. Some people think that being a Christian is having your sins forgiven. Well, of course it is. But there's much more to it than that. We've got a prospect of appearing with Christ himself forever and ever in glory. And there won't be any division. Oh, well, I'm an Anglican. I'm a Baptist. I'm this. Are you? Are you? I'm a Calvinist. I'm an Arminian. Very good. I have my views about all that, by the way. Oh, yes, I have my views. But my friend, when it comes to the acid test, am I in Christ or not? Not am I a Baptist? Am I a particular Baptist? Am I a strict and particular Baptist? The answer is yes, really, yeah. But am I in Christ? It's not have I got my prophecy sorted out? Have I got communion sorted out? Have I got all this sort? I know about eldership. Oh, that's very good. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not dismissing it. But the great thing, because Christ is all, he must be the great thing. Some of you may have heard of a man called John Cotton. John Cotton lived in the 1600s. He was a Puritan preacher. And John Cotton preached in Lincolnshire in Boston. 
in Lincolnshire. But in the 1600s, he emigrated, as many Puritans did, uh, from England under Charles II. He emigrated to New England to escape persecution here, and because they weren't wanted, they tried to set up a place in New England, in Massachusetts, and John Cotton went there. There were two other men who had become down famous men, Thomas Shepard and uh, Thomas Hooker, and John Cotton. These three were very important men in New England. And this is what John Cotton said. He said, before I go to bed at night, he said, I like to have a morsel of Calvin. What he meant was, before he went to bed, he would read a page or so from Calvin's works. He liked the taste of Calvin when he went to bed. What I'm trying to do this morning is leave you with the taste of Christ. A taste of Christ. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about myself. It's easy to preach on Christ is all. Oh, that my soul could love him more. Oh, that I really felt that he is my all in all. another Puritan called William Perkins, a bit earlier than John Cotton. He was at Cambridge. And William Perkins, is, one of his great fames, is that he was the model Puritan preacher. And he had, he set out for the Puritans the way they should preach. And he had a saying, I've told you of it before, and one of his sayings was, what's the use of it? What's the use of it? What he meant by that was, okay, you give solid doctrine to the people, but you haven't finished when you've set out the doctrine. What's the use of it? What does it mean in life? What does it mean in experience? It's got to be applied. That's what he's saying. A good many people today, in my estimation, as I listen to them, who would build monuments to the Puritans, don't understand that dictum. They seem to think they finish when they've given the doctrine. They've only just started. It's got to be practical use. And that's what I'm saying about this. Here's the doctrine, Christ is all. You want to be saved? I'm addressing believers, of course, this morning in this text. But if an unbeliever should hear this, what can I say? Keep listening. The truth is, if you want to know about the Christian experience or whatever it is, it's easy. It's three words. Christ is all. You need Christ. Oh, I wish I had your faith. You don't need my faith. You need Christ. I wish I knew what you knew. You don't need to know what I know. You need Christ because Christ is all. Martin Luther, I think, made a... I can understand him, but I'm I'm divided about it. You know he added the word alone in Romans chapter 3 in the translation. We are justified by Christ by faith alone. He added that word in the text in Romans 3. And there's been much quarreling with, uh, with Luther over this. It's not in Paul's words... But he added it, and he justified it. I think he got away with it, but I can see why the argument is against him. He was trying to make the case against Rome, because everybody, all the cults, Rome will say, oh yes, it is Christ, it is Christ, but they always add and. Christ and. You've got to come to the Kingdom Hall, or Christ and in baptism, or Christ and this. There's always an and. And he was trying to make the point, there is no and. It's Christ is all. So there's the word for the ungodly. 
You don't need religion, you don't need this and that, but you do need Christ. And once you have Christ, you've got it all. Now I said about the use of it. I want to give you perhaps a couple of uses if I can. And there's many others we could make. I want to make the first application to preaching. Now don't switch off and say, well, I'm not a preacher. We're all preachers, and anyway, you're all listening to preaching. You're doing it now, <laughs> if this is preaching. So you're all tied up in this. Preaching is a very important thing for us. We've made it so. It's a big part of our life. How does this apply to preaching? Well, I've heard a lot more preaching in recent years. Because I don't preach so much myself, I listen to many other preachers. And I'll say this to you. I don't think there's enough of Christ preached. Now, that's my view. A man was preaching one day. I think I've told you this story, but some of you won't have heard it. A man was preaching one day, and he had his friend in the congregation, and afterwards they discussed the man's preaching. And the friend who was hearing him said, well, it was a very good sermon, but he said there wasn't enough of Christ in it for me. But the preacher said, ah, oh, well, he said, but Christ was not in my text. So the man listening said this. I don't care where you live in England, he said. You could live in Dartmoor, in the wilds of Dartmoor, or you could live up on Bleaklow, up in the Lake District, up in the, up in the Peak District, uh, above Snake Pass, miles from anywhere. But if you go out of your front door, you will find a little track. And if you follow that track, you will come to a little pathway. And if you follow that pathway, you will come to a lane. And if you follow that lane, you will come to a little road. And if you follow that road, you will come to a B road. And if you follow that B road, you will come to a main road. And one day you'll end up in London. And they said, I don't care where you start in England, you can always find a path to London. And he said this, I don't care where you are in the Bible you'll find a way to Christ. Yeah. And it's your job as a preacher to find that way and take the people there with you. Think about it. Remember what Christ said on the Mayor's Road? Yeah. Should not the Christ have suffered? How do you get that? Christ in all the... Scriptures. Christ in all the scriptures. In Moses, the prophets, yeah. in the Psalms, you'll find him. Are you looking at Abraham offering Isaac? Well, you can see the man sacrificing his son. But what do you really see there? The ram caught in the thicket, offered in the stead of his son. What do you really see? You see Christ there. Look at the Passover. Yes, the lamb being, you know, all the rest of it, coming across the Red Sea. What do you really see? A picture of Christ and the deliverance of his people. Christ. Now, those of you who know me fairly well, I think you will agree with me when I say that I'm a stickler for doctrine. I write books about it. I'm writing a book at the moment on something called propitiation. Doctrine to me is very important, vital. And I deplore the present time in which I live, which it seems to me that many people are just not very concerned about doctrine. They're not curious about it. They'd rather have a nice feeling. I enjoy it. I don't want to know about this doctrinal business. It only makes divisions. I don't want that. I dread what's coming because of that. So doctrine to me is vital. I think most of you who know me would Agree, that's my position. But now I'm going to say something to contradict that, seemingly. 
I deplore that so much preaching today, in the Reformed world anyway, which is what I listen to mostly, is preaching doctrine. This morning, I'm preaching on redemption. And you get 25 points on redemption. Tonight, I'm preaching on justification. They don't say that, but that's what it amounts to. And you get 15 points on justification. They can't remember them because they got them written down. And you're expected to remember them, but you can't, so you write them down. See, I deplore it. Take propitiation. I'm writing a book on it, so I'm arguing about it. But I haven't come here to preach, preach propitiation. I'm preaching next week. I shan't preach propitiation. If I wanted to preach propitiation, what would I do? I would preach Christ. How do you mean? Listen to Paul writing to the Romans. God set him forth, Christ set him forth as a propitiation. If you want to preach propitiation, you preach Christ because he is propitiation. John says the same. We have a propitiation, Jesus Christ the righteous. Think about it, my friend. What did Paul say to the Corinthians? He has made unto us wisdom. You want to speak about wisdom? Then preach Christ, because he is wisdom. He's all. Made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, whatever it is. I am the good shepherd. I am the bread. I am the life. I am the door. I am the gate. I am the water. I want to preach on truth. I am the truth. I want to preach on the way. I am the way. I want to preach on the life. I am the life. Preach Christ. Because if you preach Christ, he's all. You've got the lot. And Christ is in all the scriptures. What's the Holy Spirit's work? When he has come, he will guide you into all truth. Yeah, wonderful. He will take the things of mine and reveal them unto you. He will glorify me. Christ said. The whole Trinity is engaged in one work. The glorification of Christ. There's a hymn in a book I'm very fond of, and I've forgotten how it goes exactly, but as, as I'm speaking to you, it, it comes back to me. Uh, I think it's by John Kent. That's the kind of man who would write this hymn. All things conspire to the lifting of Jesus on high. The lifting of Jesus. He said, I, if I be lifted up, you want to see sinners saved? Don't preach for conversion. Preach Christ. Of course, you preach for conversion. You preach the gospel, but you preach Christ in that gospel. And he being lifted up, he will draw all men to me. I was to himself. So what I say to you, I say to myself as a preacher, encourage all preachers who preach Christ to you. Make that the insistence. Give me Christ. Give me Jesus. I need to hear of him. Let me just have one more use before I sit down. By the way, the Lord's Supper in a moment. What's all that about? Do this in remembrance of <laughs> me. Me. One last use. It won't be long <coughs> before I'm coming to the end of this life. What is going to sustain me on a dying bed? What's going to be the thought? Would to God that it would be Christ is all. All my hope on Christ is stayed. I have no other advocate. I have no other plea. Jesus is alone. What did the Greeks say to Philip? Sir, we would see Jesus. I've seen that in pulpits, you know. I've seen that. It wouldn't. 
I was written across the back. The preacher stands up. What hits him in the eye? Sir, we would see Jesus. I hope they still would see Jesus. It's a good text, isn't it? Christ is all. All our hope, all our salvation, all our joy is bound up in Christ. The Father's designed to glorify the Son. The Spirit glorifies Him. And we are in Christ and one day we shall be glorified in Him. I don't know what more I can say. Christ is all and in all. Name, Charles Wesley. Yeah, it just comes to me as I'm speaking. Thou art Christ, all in thee I find, and so on. Names and sects and parties fall. Thou, O Christ, art all in all. That was Wesley's idea, Charles Wesley. Lovely thought, isn't it? Thou, O Christ, art all in all. May that name be sounded in this room time and time again. May the day never come when Christ is absent in the preaching here and in the lives of the people here. I commend you to God and the word of his grace, of course I do, and I commend myself to it. But Christ is all, my brothers and sisters. Let us take, take our parting leave with that thought. Christ in you, Christ in me, Christ in us, the hope of glory. May we ever give praise to him. And one day we shall meet again when we are exalted in glory with this great and glorious Redeemer. In addition to what I've said about the preaching, the preaching of Christ and not doctrine, let us never forget what Paul said to the Corinthians. I was determined, he said, I was resolved to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. All demands for eloquence and rhetoric and all the rest, he would have none of it. I was resolved. I settled in my mind. I was determined. 1 Corinthians 2. I was settled in my mind. I would preach nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. As he told the Corinthians again in the second letter, we preach Christ Jesus, the Lord. And as he said to the Colossians in chapter 1 and verse 28, we proclaim Christ, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. We proclaim Christ. I was resolved to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ. We preach Christ Jesus the Lord. Not doctrine, not confession of faith, not churchianity, not church attendance, but preaching Christ. I, if I am lifted up, said Christ, and the apostle was determined to lift him up. Another application, the context of uh, Colossians chapter 3 is progressive sanctification, the growing in grace of the believer. What is the motive for this? The preciousness of Christ, that Christ being all. This is the great motive. This is the central text here in Colossians uh, chapter 3. And the passage is all about believers. Now they've died with Christ, they're raised with Christ, they're looking forward to Christ, coming again of Christ. Now they must grow into Christ and be conformed to Christ, be transformed into his likeness. How is that? By the gazing upon Christ, turning their eyes full up in his wonderful face, and the things of the earth growing strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. The motive for sanctification. So the motive for preaching, the person we preach, the way of sanctification, the way of comfort. Christ is all and in all. May he be precious to us. Unto you who believe, he is precious. He is all and in all. Blessed, blessed be his name.